This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at two new Irish films, the musical dramedy Flora and Son and the senior romantic drama My Sailor, My Love. The new thriller Cat Person featuring the star of Coda, Amelia Jones. The comedic film Dumb Money with Paul Dano that's based on a true story, plus the new limited series Love and Death featuring Elizabeth Olsen. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rose, and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly critic roundtable show, where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me are Justine Browning from Entertainment Weekly, Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby, and Mike Sargent from WBAI and the Brown and Black podcast. So let's start out with a look at several new films and limited series in theaters and or streaming, beginning with a new movie called Flora and Son about a single mom struggling with a delinquent teenage son who both find common ground through music. Let's take a look at a clip. I can't go on like this. Okay, let's go. No, I mean in life. Oh, this can't be my story. Living in a shoebox with a kid who hates me and his dad who doesn't see me. This can't be my narrative. He rejected your Prezi, so what? You didn't even buy it, in fairness, and you forgot his birthday. Well, you are a great mother, am I? Justine, tell me about Flora and Son. Well, this is from Irish director John Carney, and if you're familiar with any of his films, such as Sing Street or Good Once, way. you know that music plays Bye. such an important role in his work, and this film is no different. This follows a struggling Dublin mother, played by Eve Hewson, who is struggling to keep her rebellious teen son in check. She thinks that music might be able to alleviate some of what he's going through. She finds a guitar in the trash and refurbishes it, but it's actually Flora who finds solace in the instrument. She begins taking online lessons with a washed up LA musician played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And she begins to find solace in the healing power of music. It turns out her son has been creating electronic beats and they come together in a beautiful symphony. The film is sweet, sentimental, and soulful. There's original music, it's an understated love story, and all around a feel-good story. Bill? It's also really, really funny. And, and, and it feels like a Richard Curtis movie, you know, kind of his sense of humor, like a love actually, but yeah. actually better than that. Uh, the struggle that they're all going through. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, there's a, I won't give it away, but there's a nice way that they blend him into the movie that's not cliched. Actually, when you describe the plot, it sounds like uh, I've sort of seen this before. You have not. The performances are great all the way around, and I can't recommend this enough. It's a little gem. I agree. I think the performances and the writing is really what makes this film, and I think that if I had any criticism, it would be the ending. I feel like I wanted the title to really mean something. You really want to understand that whole thing. But I, I think it works, I'd say, 95%. Well, you know, if handled, as you were saying, Bill, for, through the description, if this was not handled right, this really could have come up come out sappy and corny, right. yeah. but it's really not. I mean, yeah. Carney really knows what he's doing here. And music, I like the fact that this dysfunctional family, music is transformative, and that's the healing thread that runs throughout the movie. Yeah. I mean, plus the music is very good in the movie. The star of the movie, if you see. yeah, she, she's Bono's daughter, so right. she's got some musical DNA yeah. there. And the she was also in Bad Sisters, that uh, series that we uh, talked about on the show before and liked so much. Uh, it, it's good from start to finish, and I think it, everyone should see it. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the movie has heart, the script is good, the performances are good, and the music makes the whole thing soar. I highly recommend Florence Son. Moving on, Bill, tell us about... <laughs> Cat Person. Yes, Cat Person. Well, I will, Neil. Cat Person <laughs> is a, a timely thriller uh, and a modern cautionary tale about do not go out with a guy who kisses really badly and is crappy in bed. Uh, it stars, and, and let's be clear about this, one of the stars of Succession, if you know that show, the guy Greg, Cousin uh, Greg, Cousin Greg, <laughs> is basically going on a date in this movie, and uh, that's sort of the setup. Amelia Jones of Coda is a concession girl at a second-run movie house, and uh, Greg from Succession, as I mentioned, is a regular patron who asks her out. 
if she turns him down, there's no movie. So out they go. He's uh, Nicholas Braun, by the way, is the actor's name. Uh, and he's also, uh, well, he doesn't take no for an answer when he starts asking for a second date. The title, A Cat Person, comes from his text. He says he has two. A funny female friend provides laughs, but things get very unfunny in the last reel. It's no promising young woman, but it has the same dark vibe, and despite a very grim ending, I'm letting the cat out of the bag. I like it. Mike? Well, I like this movie a lot, too, and what I like about it, along with another movie we're seeing today, is that it's written and directed by a woman, and you feel it within the first few minutes of the film. So it's three women that came together create this and as someone who has seen a lot of movies and most of them are from let's just say the male gaze I really enjoyed what could have been handled very differently if it was written by a man there are a lot of details mm -hmm. here that I, that I thought really make this work and by the time we get to the third act like you said you're like whoa and so. you'll like or hate it because of that ending I think absolutely just, and this is based on Kristen Rapirian's 2017 short story right. it went viral because so many women could identify with how this story captures that gray area when it comes to consent that particular scene in the film is handled in a, in a very innovative way that really shows the inner monologue that the character is dealing with that she, as she's in this intimate intimate moment but she's struggling internally with how she'd, she should handle it. I think that was captured brilliantly. And then some of the twists and turns that make the short story something that so many connected to then actually takes a lot of liberties with the film, a lot of twists that I felt actually veered into some cliches it actually took away what the, sh yeah. the short story accomplished. See, I disagree. I think it, it sets up a number of things that could have happened differently sure. and didn't. And so you're left wondering, and I think people are going to debate about this movie when they leave right. it. Is he a bad guy or isn't he a bad guy? Well, was she misled or that was, was she misleading him? The strength of the well, that, yeah, was that, you didn't the, know. The, the you first could hour identify. of the movie, I'm really like tension filled. Right. I'm like, yeah, exactly what you're saying, Mike. Is this guy a psycho or is he just like a nerdy guy? Mm -hmm. And in the New Yorker short story that you're talking about, there is no third act. It ends like where the second act of this movie ends. Right. And I don't like the third act. The third act is like this obligatory blood fest. We're going to like, okay, we're going to have to do this thing that we've seen in dozens and thousands of but other... But not uh, as well as here, I would argue. Not as well with, as Justine said, a lot of little twists that you go, oh, maybe he was telling the mm -hmm. truth, or maybe he wasn't. Maybe this, maybe is a good guy, maybe mm -hmm. he's not. That, to me, is the brilliance of the writing. Well, I like Nicholas Braun, and I really like um, Amelia Jones from CODA. I think the performance el performances elevate it, but, you know, to me, that, that, that third act, that last 25 minutes, just, it, it doesn't sync up with the rest of the movie, and it just brings the whole the whole thing down so I would recommend it but with an asterisk like not strongly it's like he's wrong okay. watch it anyway he's wrong. He's wrong. I think everyone should see it I should be clear about that <laughs> I like however right. we can debate the ending all right Mike tell me about uh, fair play well this is another film as I said that is written and directed by a woman and this is Chloe DeMont's uh, feature film debut and what I like about it is again within the first few minutes you realize this is a film that no man would write and I like it's it's about two uh, people who work at a hedge fund, a Wall Street hedge fund here in New York. One of them thinks they're going to get the promotion, the man, and of course his girlfriend is very happy. They're dating, nobody knows they're dating, they work at the same company and it's against company rules, but then everything shifts. She ends up getting the promotion. And now we see who he really is and what he's really made of. It is a meditation on the male ego. It is a meditation on ambition. It is a meditation on what makes a relationship work and not work. It's really about gender dynamics, but it's also about power dynamics, which is really powerful in this film. I really like Alden Ehrenreich in this, and I also really like... I do. And I really like Phoebe Denever in this role. I like them in this film, and I like the film. I didn't think that the ending was as satisfying as I wanted it to be, but I did like this movie you know, quite a bit. I, I think it's an interesting twist on the cutthroat world of Wall Street, mm -hmm. and the twist here is that the protagonist is a woman. Usually when you see these kind of films, it's exactly. all men working here, right. and she's the center of the film. And what's really interesting, and what the direct, the writer-director Chloe DeMont did here, is she's got this great premise of here's a woman that's like gonna get engaged, she's engaged and she's in love with this guy, and when she doesn't get the, when he get, doesn't get the promotion, and he starts doing, gaslighting her and doing all these horrible things to her, you know, her intellectual side is like, 
you know, I've got, I've risen to this position of power because I know what I'm doing, but her emotional side gets her all messed up because how could he possibly do this? This is my fiance. And I think that's a really good premise, and I think she makes the most out of what she's constructed here. She's Bill? the star here. I think he's in way over his head. I didn't buy him at all. Mm -hmm. I, he was constantly saying he was on her side, and I knew he wasn't. I knew he was very upset Reich. with, yeah, I, I knew he he was upset. He was fine in Hail Caesar as a cowpoke. He's been in little movies and he's had small parts, but this is the first time he's actually had to step up and uh, co-star in a big movie. Uh, 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 Han Solo. Yeah, I know. I don't. I, I don't even count that. I mean, listen, th that's a better. That's a better role for him because it doesn't require what this requires. Uh, I'm. I like her. Uh, she's coming to Emily Blunt's stunt double, but uh, I think I, I'm. I'm not recommending Fair Play. I would say that to me the imbalance there actually worked, that she was such a powerhouse to watch and she was so captivating. You know, Chloe DeMont has directed billions and she's really skillful in terms of you know, the heightened tension that goes on in the, in the, in the financial world. As Neil said, you know, margin call, boiler room. We right. have these films that are that are the big short, go on and on. That are really <laughs> focusing on you know men in the workplace. But this is a really heightened gestation on how one has to balance domestic life with power at work, and the stakes are so high up until that you know final sequence. The tension is so palpable. So again, it has a lot to say. This is the film that I was actually hoping Cat Person would be. So there's a bit of a twist that the financial drama actually delivered. Cat Person is better. <laughs> Listen, her, the, the fact that his ego can't handle the fact mm -hmm. that, and that just changes the whole dynamic mm -hmm. of their relationship, is one of the things that makes this thing it's, interesting. And what she has to do navigating thing. a man's world, you know, is also... And the, the claustrophobia, the stark gray, the cult-like sort of frat boy culture within this space where the walls feel like they're closing in. I thought that really heightened. And Eddie Marsden for me is sort of phoning it in now. I was disappointed in him as the heavy that's in charge of the... He didn't really have much to do though. That's, um, that's Netflix unfortunate. Netflix paid a lot for this movie. I think it's going to pay off. Oh. I think so too. Okay. Joan Baez, I Am Noise is a new documentary about the folk singer and political activist. Let's take a look at a clip. I remember very clearly driving around when I was driving to my own concerts, and I'd introduce them on the stage, and the audience would go, ooh, and I'd say, listen to this guy. It didn't take very long for them to listen to this guy. You know. You say you're looking for someone who'll pick you up each time you fall. Justine, tell us about Joan Baez, I Am Noise. This is an incredible tribute to the 60-year career of iconic folk singer Joan Baez, as the title says. And what's so interesting that I think distinguishes this film from your typical musical biopic or concert film is the fact that we're with her now at 79 years old. We are seeing the person behind the persona. We are there with her as she struggles through vocal coaching sessions, but also in her more celebratory moments where she's literally dancing through the streets. The film is chronicling, chronicling a lot of her achievements, her activism, but it's following her on her farewell tour in 2019 specifically and capturing that as she looks back on her life. So again, we are with her. We are not spectators. We are not looking at the character on stage. We're learning about what she was grappling with, at times anxiety and other really horrific traumas that she has seldom discussed that she brings into the fold here that make what she was known as during the height of her fame, right, this saintly image all the more confounding. Mike? Well, I agree with you. I think uh, very often the, the narrative structure of a documentary doesn't lend itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it can become either too linear or, you know, too contextual or, but I think that this really worked. I think that, that she has a fascinating life and I think that this movie took its time. It's almost lyrical in many moments where it takes its time. I think you have to be in the mood and you really have to care about Joan Baez or you might you know, drift a little, but I do think it's it's a great tribute to someone whose life we really only know a little bit about. If I was going to write a protest song about this movie, it would be, it is a little too long. Uh, but I will say to people that uh, are huge Bob Dylan fans, there was a romance there that I never knew about, and there was also some footage. Now, this is the thing we haven't told you. She had clips and tapes and, and in a, like a storage wars from that TV show 
uh, uh, giant uh, facility, and that's come into play here. The filmmakers have been very shrewd to take all of that and make her story. As Justine said, we thought she was walking with Martin Luther King and feeling strong about herself. She was crumbling inside. She was really good at singing those songs, but backstage she was throwing up or she was on drugs or she was having problems. And this is a warts and all portrayal, and for that, I think it's worth seeing. I think, and I agree with you, Mike, I think a lot of this depends on how much you like Joan Baez. If you're not a Joan Baez fan, I think you. I think it is a, a bit too long. But I found a lot of this interesting, including, as you said, Bill. I did know about the romance with Bob Dylan, but what I did not know about was that she was the one that brought him on stage first. That yeah. she helped. And there's footage of that. There's she him literally him discovered that him. That yeah, bring him great. to fame, and I had no idea. And then she breaks. He breaks her heart. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Also, I say if you are a fan of Joan Baez, or if you're looking for a history lesson on a time that no longer exists, although it does take place in the present, but there's a lot of the 60s in here too, then check it out. Bill, tell us about My Sailor, My Love. Well, this is a lushly photographed, beautiful Irish by the sea tale of two older people and a daughter who doesn't necessarily agree with what's going on. Let me explain. It stars James Cosmo as an old sailor who needs a housekeeper but won't hire one, so his daughter, a nurse who really wants the job, more on that in a moment, hires local caretaker Bridge Brennan, or Brid Brennan. Uh, the old salt hates her, but Faster than you can say, who sent my uniform to the cleaners, he suddenly adores her. This is the fastest turnaround in cinematic history. He brings some flowers and suddenly she moves in with him. Well, as I said, the daughter doesn't love this whole setup. Uh, she wants to get her father's affection back for some reason. That's the most interesting dynamic in this whole thing. I'm making it sound like I didn't like it, and I actually do like this movie a lot. It moves slowly, but so do old people. I'm one of them. So I know this for a fact. It has a kind of merchant ivory feel, and it's rare these days, but bring a Kleenex because this one will get you. Yeah, I absolutely loved what this film had to say about generational trauma. I think the cinematographer Robert Nordstrom, he does so much with the scenery. He is using the wildness of the water and all of the different elements of this coastal town to really heighten the emotional tension and it serves as, as an extension of where the characters are, sometimes the divide between them, but also just all that they're grappling with. I found Grace's story to be the most compelling actually in the, the film. Yeah, Grace yeah. the daughter. And I think, and I've said it before on this show, it's so rare that we do see stories about those later in life making connections and grappling with all that has come before. But we're seeing more and more of them, and because yes. I'm old, I can't remember the titles. Uh, well, I, I, I pretty much agree with both of you. I, I do think that the story with Grace and the daughter, the father-daughter relationship, and the generational trauma, I think that that was actually the more powerful story. Mm -hmm. You know, I like the idea of this uh, late-in-life romance, but I did feel it was mm, slightly contrived, you know? I think it's a lovely, subtle, and beautiful film um, about adults for adults. And as Bill said, they just, you know, with this onslaught of movies that are catering to a young teenage audience, it's a pleasure to see a, a grown-up movie for a change. And James Cosmo and Brid Brennan are terrific, and they elevate the thing. And as you said, this Irish countryside with, with the cinematographer captured, I just kept looking at these shots and going, yeah. You know, I want to go there. I want to look at this. this I thought just... it was a character in the film, yes. actually. I thought yeah, the absolutely. setting and where they were, because they set you up. You hear the ocean and everything before you even the see sound anything. Design was the also sound design an was very powerful. Yeah. I, I, uh, I ate a bowl of Lucky Charms right after it. I really <laughs> did. <laughs> it's a sensitive, grown up movie, and I think it's well worth a look. I'm here testifying today, far removed from my background. I grew up in a middle class family in Portland, Maine. My dad was a grocery store executive. Maybe leave that part out part about my dad? The executive part. Okay, okay. I went to a public high school. I studied hard and got into Northwestern. Did you say Pun a good college? I can't say I went to Northwestern. To elite. Northwestern was too bad. That was a clip from the new film, Dumb Money. It's Justine Browning's personal choice as we go around the panel with our critics' picks of the month. Justine. Yes, well, the class warfare film canon just got a new addition in the form of this incredible true story about a young man amid the 2020 pandemic, the shutdown, he's struggling to make ends meet, 
and he's slowly building an online following on YouTube and he convinces his growing community to invest stock in GameStop. Yes, the video game store you can find at most malls. So he flips the script on Wall Street and gradually a gaggle of billionaires begins to panic and fights to get the whole thing shut down. This incites an online rebellion and ultimately this case is heard at the Supreme Court eventually. What this does is highlight the widening wealth divide in this country and how much of that was really brought to the, brought to the forefront amid COVID-19. It has a powerhouse cast, it's a riot, and it's an all around crowd pleaser and social critique at the same time. The cast in this is, is incredible. I mean, Paul Dano, Pete Davidson, Vincent D'Onofrio, America Ferrara, Nick Offerman, yeah. you know, it sounds really good. Um, you highly recommend it. And I My question really is whether Pete Davidson it. can carry a movie. We haven't seen him do it since The King of Staten Island. Is he, does he step up here and does he command the screen or is he? He dull? has a supporting role as the lead character's deadbeat brother. And so if you've seen any of his work, you know right. he absolutely nails it. Phone that one in. <laughs> well, my question is, is it a good double feature with Fair Play? It's yeah. a good double feature with The Big Short. And the Big Short, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm it's, It feels like a sequel to The Big Short. And again, for people who don't know, this really this happened. Really yeah, happened. it's a great premise. It's I remember really when real. it happened. I remember too. Bill, what you pick this month? Well, mine is a Netflix series. It's not a movie. It's eight episodes, and it's called The Diplomat, or at least the first season is eight episodes. Uh, it stars Carrie right Russell from The Americans as uh, a Middle East expert asked to be our new ambassador to the United Kingdom and maybe our next vice president. They don't bring that up enough, like every 10 minutes. Uh, it's serious, but it's also laugh out loud funny, thanks to the brilliant casting of Rufus Sewell from the movie Old recently as her conniving, politically connected husband. It's the Clintons go to London, and it's one of my favorite series. It has a great supporting set of characters, the smart banter, and a fantastic uh, cliffhanging series end at the end of this first season. Uh, get season two over the pond as fast as you can, Netflix. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. The marital jousting between Carrie uh, Russell amazing. and Rufus Sewell is the stuff that 1940s classics are made of. This has everything. It's, it, it's a thriller at times, right? It has espionage. It also has discussions about global policy that are somehow very compelling and a bit saucy. And seems smart and real, not contrived for absolutely. television. Absolutely. My pick is the seven-part miniseries Love and Death. It follows the true story of what happened in a small suburban Texas town in the late 70s and early 80s. Candy Montgomery, played by Elizabeth Olsen, and Alan Gore, played by Jesse Plemons, are two married, church-going Texans who engage in what I would describe as the lamest extramarital affair I have ever seen. The affair eventually comes to an end, but Plemons wife gets wind of it, gets jealous, and let's just say there's an ax involved. After that, the remaining episodes are like an amazing arc of a Law & Order SVU series. Olsen deserves an Emmy for her remarkable performance. The miniseries was written and created by the brilliant writer David E. Kelly, who's responsible for such gems as L.A. Law and Big Little Lies, and the writing here is exceptional. I didn't know this real life story, even though there was another miniseries last year called Candy, starring Jessica Biel, which I hear is nowhere near as good as this. Whether that's true or not, I can't tell you, but what I can say is Love and Death is witty, gripping, and eye-opening. I was hooked from the very first five minutes until the end and went from laughter to shock. This one is one of the best miniseries I've seen in some time, and it's highly recommended. It's on HBO Max. Please check it out. Finally, our very own Mike Sargent has a very special critics pick this month. Mike, tell us Tell us about your pick and why I said it's a special pick. Well, I wouldn't call it my pick, okay, because it sounds very self-aggrandizing, uh, but I did. I directed a film that's on VOD yeah. now. Hey. Uh, it is a paranormal horror movie. It's and called it cool. From the Shadows, starring uh, Bruce Davison, Keith David, and Selena Andrews. Bruce Davidson from Willard. From Willard. One from of the X -Men classics. From you want to tell us a little bit about it? Okay, it is about a, sell us your movie. I'll sell you the movie. It's about, there was a cult, okay, and it was called the Hidden Wisdom Cult. They tapped into something that could save humanity, but then at the main compound there was a gigantic fire. Everybody was killed except for five kids. And everybody thinks that maybe they set the fire. Maybe this was a suicide cult. And the top 
paranormal debunker in the country gets contacted by them because they want to tell their story to her. They figure if they tell her and they can convince her, they can convince the rest of the world that hidden wisdom is real, they didn't kill their friends, and the FBI would leave them alone. And how did you get this done? It was hard. We're in theaters as we're recording this, mm -hmm. but it'll be on Voodoo through the month of October. But by the time this airs, it'll be available on VD, VOD on everything else. So, yes, it's, it's definitely a challenge, you know, but I, I think eventually if you have something, you know, we, we did festivals and we won a bunch of festivals and you became like a horror festival darling, as it were. So after a while, if the film is good, you know, the cream will rise to the top. Wow. Well, the movie is called From the Shadows. It is our colleague and friend Mike Sargent. We, 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 we do. We watch do. the film, please. We do. And that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Justine Browning, Mike Sargent, and Bill McCuddy. I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures.